All righty, everyone. Let's continue. So I hope uh, you enjoyed lunch and there was enough for everyone. Um, so our next speaker uh, is uh, George. And if you have ever used the um, Travis uh, Nix integration uh, uh, and you enjoy using that, uh, then give uh, George a hand afterwards because he's the one responsible for it. Uh, but it's, uh, that is not the topic for today because today George is going to talk to us about uh, Nix for data pipeline configuration. Enjoy and give him a hand. Um, hello there. Um, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay. I'd like to start with a short show of hands. Is there anybody here that is working with something around data science or machine learning or big data? Some of you. And um, any of you are, any of you are using tools like Luigi or Airflow, that kind of things to schedule and, and run your batch jobs? A few of you. So for the few of you, the short version is I, I replaced that with Nix. Let's go for the long version. So, hi, I'm George. I already said that. Um, I work at SoundCloud. It's a music streaming platform where artists upload their own music themselves. And what I do there is that I do recommendations. Uh, because anybody can upload anything, it's kind, it can be quite hard to actually find content you like. And my team and I, we, we build tools that generate recommended playlists with content you might like. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Come talk to me afterward if you want to know more about that. But for the purpose of that talk, all you need to know is that it's mostly, mostly batch jobs, uh, which means it's long-running jobs that run on all of our users' data. They, they take hours, they read data somewhere, they write it somewhere else. And the reason I'm here today is that because I tried to use Nix for my batch jobs. So why? Why did I do that? L let me give you a little bit more context about uh, what that is. So, I said earlier, we have batch jobs. They are, uh, at, at the lowest level, they are commands we run. We write them in various languages. Some of them is in Scala, some of them is in C, and in the end, it's just a command we run, giving it some input, giving it, it some output. And we've got a bunch of them, and they've got dependencies between them. Some of them will expect some other one to have run before. And part of the job of having part of the Part of having these batch jobs is to make sure that they run in the right order, they run with the right uh, output. I don't want to accidentally run today's, uh, today's run with um, uh, yesterday's data because I, I will get some weird results. And I need to have some, some fine control about how this runs. This is an example, it's a simplification of the thing we run in production. We have a bunch of different jobs. Some of, their share, some of them share dependencies, some of them do not. And it's, it can be kind of a mess to configure and to well, to, to maintain and, and, and monitor. Um, just a bit more, more context. Uh, all the job we have, all the data we have, it's stored on, on something called HDFS. Stands for Hadoop Distributed File System. It's a, it's a distributed file system, a clustered file system. So we have a bunch of machines, and every machine holds some of the data. The data is not centralized anywhere. And that gives us an interesting property when we develop with that, is that we don't care about the individual machine file systems. We only care about that big centralized, that big singleton, the HDFS. We don't care about this machine or that machine. It's just there is only one file system for us wh when we work with that, which is kind of a nice simplification. And these bad jobs, we run them daily because we compute new recommendations for users daily, but we also run them multiple times a day while we are developing. So we, we've got one production run a day and then I'm trying some new logic, trying some new things. I'm going to run the job and run it again, iterating multiple times. And it's kind of the distinction between the production run and the development run that, that is kind of the, the source of this, the initial annoyance that, that led me to, to pursue this. Because for, for production, we want the batch jobs, they, we want them to be, um, we, we want them to be nice to express. We, we want them to be reliable. We want them to run every day in production. They run every night. We don't want them to fail and come in the morning and realize we failed. Um, we want them to be maintainable. I want to come back in months and, and be able to still figure out wha what's happening. But for the development size, I care about, about flexibility. I care about doing as fast as possible some new thing, trying something out in order to, well, to get to the next, next thing quickly. And these two things don't really work together. 
at least for the tools we currently have for this, they either have some of the property of being stable and, and good for production or being flexible and good for, for development. And I wanted to, to try something that would kind of have both. Um, to give you a bit more of an idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about flexibility and tweaking, here is an, an example of one of the pipeline we have. So these are a bunch of, of bad jobs. It computes some recommended playlists. And we start with a set of candidates. Uh, candidates is what we call tracks that might end up in the user playlist, but we are not sure yet. And we have multiple batch jobs that will enrich them and filter them and then score them and finally make the final playlist. And this is in production. This runs every night. But now I want to write some new filtering code because we realize the old one is rubbish and we can, we can make it better. And I've done it. I've written the code. I've compiled it. It's on my laptop. And I, I'm ready to run a new job. And what I want is to run the new filtering code and then roll, run the stuff that depends on it because I, I'm actually interested in the final result. What impact does my change to this job has on the final result of the whole pipeline? And ideally, I'll, I would also want to do, to do that without having to rerun candidates and enrich candidates because I, I know they will be the same. I did not change anything there. And so, sadly, with the current tooling we have, the only way I have to do that is to go to whatever tool I have in production, look how, how the filtered candidate job was run, copy that command, and then edit the, the parts I want to edit. Change the, the code, change the path to the code I'm using, change the path of the output in HDFS, and then I go to the next job, the scored candidate, and I do the same. I copy the, the command, I change the input path and the output path, and I run it, and, and same for the last one, Wh which, is, which is, well, first of all, it's annoying, but it's more that than annoying. It, it's unnecessarily hard. And the reason I really find it's a problem is because it's bad incentive. We want the right thing to be, uh, we want the right thing to be easy. The right thing is to test my job completely, um, check the final result, but if it's hard, I will be a bit less likely to do it. At, at some point, I will just stop doing it and the, the, the quality will be reduced. So it's really a matter of, of aligning incentive. The right thing should be the, uh, the easy one to do, and that's what I want to reach here. I want, I'm testing the whole thing to be, to be easy, not hard and annoying. And another example to show that it's not only a development versu versus production problem actually, is I've now written my, my, new, my new filtering logic and I want to, well, I'm not quite sure it's actually that better from the, uh, that better than the, the original one. And to make sure it's actually better, we, we're using a technique we, we, we use quite a lot, uh, which is testing, A-B testing. So the idea is that I'm going to take my old logic that generates my old recommendation and the new one that generates the, the new recommendation, and I'm going to save both to different set of users. And then I'm going to compare how it performs. For example, if I'm interested in the, listen the listening time in this playlist to see if user like them, I'm going to compare the user of the old playlist and the user of the new playlist. But in order to be able to do that, I, I, will need to, to, I will need to compute both that of playlists, both that of recommendations. So I will need to actually compute both branches of that pipeline. And with the, currently tools, uh, the current tools I have in, in production, the current tools I use to define my pipelines, I have no choice but to just duplicate the parts I want to run twice. I'm going to duplicate the filtered candidates, the scored candidates, and the final playlist, and just copy past them. and then tweak the path to, to make sure that they, they write to different, uh, to different places. Otherwise, it's well just going to be one, one big mess that's going to stop working or worse. And, and I find this, uh, well, I, I find this annoying and I find, find this hard. And it's going to be even worse to maintain because say I have to make some changes in the future to one of the, the jobs, I'm going to have to do it twice. Otherwise, they're going to do that. It's going to be a maintenance nightmare. And the thing I want to reach here is that the code, uh, the code for to express my pipeline should be as simple as the idea I want to express. If the idea I want to express is I want to run the whole thing, but changing the filtering logic, it should not be more. It should not be oh I'm going to copy past it and then type some change here and there to make it work. It should be expressing the whole thing, but with a different filtering logic. And that that's the thing I wanted to to reach. And well, with that in mind, and I, I turn to Nix. Um, because Nix, first of all, because Nix is it's, it's a pretty nice language for uh, package definitions. Um, Nix packages contains, a it's, 
it's very nice to contribute to Nix packages, to, to make a change to some package, because the package definition is, is actually very nice in Nix. But more, more than that, and that's really the thing that made me look into, uh, into Nix to work with that, is, is because it's, it's a language that actually allows you to manipulate definitions. Uh, if you want to change a package in Nix, you don't have to copy past the definition and then change it. You can actually, in the language itself, make, make tweaks, make overrides. Um, in the previous example, I had the package definition for the less package. I can actually use that definition and say, oh, yeah, but actually the NCURS dependency is going to be another one. It's going to be that different version. And this looks very similar to the thing I actually want to reach. So this is why I wanted to try and use Nix for to solve this, pr this problem of mine. Um, so let's talk about how I actually did it. Wha w what is the final result? So I'd like to introduce you to, to Mix. Uh, I'm very bad at naming, so the thing is called Mix, uh, which is an, implement an implementation of Nix dedicated to data pipeline. I'm saying an implementation of Nix, but most of the actual implementation works happen in the HNIX uh, library that, uh, that I'm using, which turns all the parsing and the evaluation of Nix. So I'm not actually re-implementing the whole of Nix. Somebody else did that for me. Thank you very much. Um, and the reason we have this new implementation is because the the definition of the uh, the derivation in Nix is no, not quite what we need. Uh, Nix has a very strong idea of, of the Nix store. Y everything that you will build will, will end up in the Nix store. Most of the time, it's going to be the slash Nix slash store uh, path. You could point Nix to something else, but you will always have one single Nix store in Nix. And that does not work very well in, in our case. First of all, because the Nix store is on your local file system, and we don't want to build stuff on our local file system. We want to build stuff on, on that HDFS. And then, where I work, we have a strong set of conventions around how stuff should be organized on HDFS. Every single team should have their own sub -deer, and different projects will also have their, their own sub -deer. So having having everything being built in one big store that contains everything is not not really an option so as a result that mix tool the the, the new thing it it it's redefining derivation the der the derivation in mix are are very similar to the one in the classical nix but they also have they they allow the output to go pretty much everywhere in the file system and not just only in the nix store um, we also implement some very simple building um, very proof of concept level. So we have we have these derivations and we we build them. We build their, their dependencies. We don't do any parallel building. We don't do any uh, any sandbox. The, the most si simple thing to get a proof of concept working. Uh, we don't even serialize the derivation. We don't write them to disk or put them on a database. We we could. That would definitely be very nice to make some some tooling around that. But this version does not. No, no such thing. It's mostly, we are mostly interested in how to build the, the, deriv the derivations. Um, the, the last piece of that is that the, um, for this, I, I decided to go with the link docker to specify how to build the derivations. Once again, it's because of pre-existing conventions. Where I work, we build most of our stuff, we build package and distribute most of our stuff with Docker containers. So the code I need to use to build my pipelines is already available as a Docker container. All the tooling for that is used. So this derivation, on top of having uh, of being able to have an output anywhere, it will also have one more attribute, with which is the container in which the de the derivation needs to to be built. It's mostly just a path through to the builder, which which will then end up calling Docker. And yeah, we end up with this new tool in which we have a derivation primitive. So this is Nix, the language, uh, but it will not be interpreted by Nix, the tool. It will be in interpreted by by Mix. Uh, this is nearly the same derivation function you would expect to see in, in classical Nix, except it has two attributes that you don't have in Nix. It has this prefix, which tells us where the um, where the, the output is actually supposed to be, and it has this container, which tel tells us how to actually build the, build the derivation. And when you run Nix, well, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do what you expect from the, the, the deri sorry, from the derivation function. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take the prefix and, uh, and the hash of the derivation and, and the name, and, and it will give you the, the possibility to, uh, to build it. Um, I said that we don't serialize the derivation. This is the pretty printing of the in-memory representation of the derivation. Um, no, nothing very fancy to see here. It's 
it's nearly the same as what you would find in the .dev file in the in the Nix store, except it has a container, um, a, a container attribute. But it it's very it's the same thing an, as an usual derivation. It has an output, and it tells you with the builder args and environment variables what to run in order to to get that output. Okay, so we've got this um, this very this tool, this mix tool, very close to Nix that is suitable to define. Uh, our, our batch jobs because it, it knows about HDFS and and it goes around the the restriction of Nix so it 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 goes with that problem. Now we end up we, we have the issue of defining an, a Nix code base. Um, the, the Nix code base being the definition of, of of the pipeline, all my batch jobs and their dependencies. We can start with the most sim simple way to do it. We define a a new derivation by just calling derivation on a very raw call to derivation for my, my first job, my candidate's job. I give the name, the container, the builder is going to be bash, and then the arguments I pass to bash, the prefix, and then some environment variable I need to provide for, for the thing to work. And, and I, ca I can make my first derivation like that, and it will look like this in memory. Nothing, nothing fancy, it's pretty much the same thing I had before. I can see that the output was, was, was filled with uh, the prefix, the hash, and the name, and, and I can run that. It will it will build it. It will run the actual Spark submit command, which is the the thing we we need to to run to to run Spark jobs, and it will put the output in the output. So far so good. Nothing, um, not nothing super fancy. It's it's not really better than just having written the bash scripts. Um, so we want to make this be better. I, I I know um, because I look at, at Nix packages. I know it. We we can make expression of packages much nicer. And I know we can we can have this overhead, this tweaking thing when we were talking about earlier. And so, in order to to see how to do that, I I looked into well, it's pretty much the only Nix code base I know. It's the one definition of all the package around Nix that that is Nix packages. And <coughs> I, I I looked into that and I I saw multiple multiple patterns that we could reuse in order to organize an, our own Nix code base in order to make it nicer and make it easier to express this. Um, these derivations, these batch jobs. Um, and the first thing we do, so here we are back with our very raw, raw definition. The first thing we do is that we are going to notice that most of the jobs we want to build, we want to build them with bash. And the thing we actually want to write is this. The difference between this one and that one is that I, I just provide the command to run in bash and I don't bother writing how to run bash and with, with what, what flags. And to define this, this bash derivation function, uh, this is actually a pattern that is very, very common in, in Nix packages. It's about um, defining, defining a function bash derivations, wh which will take a set of, of attributes um, that will call derivation with these attributes, but on top of doing that, it will also pick some stuff out of this set of attributes and use them to inject some new arguments here. So in, in this case, it, we are mostly interested in the common and the container that, that are being passed, and then we pass them to derivation, but we also add the builder that is gonna always going to be bash and the args, which are always going to be dash ec command. And this, thing, this pattern that is, that is very, very common in Nix packages allows us to, well, it allows us to, to have this bash derivation that, that let us define this. So no, every single derivation I have that, will, mm, that I will want to build with bash rather than just in invoking the the row, um, the, the the row builder, I will be able to use that. But we, we can go further because I know most of my jobs are going to be Spark jobs, and there's a lot of well, if I look here, there's a lot of stuff that are boilerplate to run Spark. So I will want to have my Spark uh, my Spark derivation uh, definition, and once again once again I will use that same pattern that function that takes a lot of that takes the attribute and extracts some interesting out of them and then calls another function, in this case called bash derivation. Not de directly derivation, but bash derivation, so I can actually layer these abstractions on top of each other. And here, I take a bunch of different arguments because there are a lot of things that I could want to configure in my, in my Spark jobs. Uh, the jar in which the code is, the class, it's, this is Java world, so the, the class, that is the entry point of, of, of the code, and and then so, some of the argument I might be interested in. And we call bash derivation with a comment that will use all these uh, all, all, all these possible uh, arguments we can override. Um, and so we have we have now this nice way to define one 
uh, one batch jobs in order to define uh, all of them. I can use a recursive set in Nix. So I will define my first de my first derivation, my first batch job candidates by calling Spark derivation, and then I will define the next one enriched candidate uh, by also a call to Spark derivation that that can refer to candidates um, because it's a recursive set and because when you try w when you refer to a derivation and you want it to be uh, uh, to be a string, you will get the you will get the output of the derivation, the output path where the derivation has actually been built. Uh, you will also get a, an, a string with, with an attached context, an, attach, an attached marker that says that this string actually comes from that derivation, which allows Nix to know that enriched candidates actually depends on candidates. Um, um, and yeah, and, and that works. I get my set of jobs. This is, this is actually my pipeline. It's the set of all my batch jobs. Uh, that depend on each other that then I can run and and that is actually that that is already pretty nice it, it's already a pretty nice language to define my pipelines uh, it allows me to have abstraction in order to refactor and reduce the code and, and keep it clear and simple it's actually better than what I, I already have in production um, but but I wanted I, I want more I want to actually tweak jobs because I've I've done nothing about this tweaking and and this flexibility I was talking about earlier what we want is this. I want to have my weekly.nix file that contains all my production, uh, my, my production definition, and I want to import it, and I want to override it. Uh, I want to take the, the candidates and say, oh, the important parameter should be, uh, sh should be set to 11 instead of 10, because it's, it's very important that it's set to 11. Uh, or at least I want to try it set to 11. And for this, we can take this, uh, this abstraction that is, that is present in uh, Nix packages, the make overridable, it's it's a it's basically a wrapper around the function. It will y when you call it, you will still get the original result of the function, but it will also inject in the result in the result set an override function that will allow you to call again that function, but overriding but tweaking the arguments which with it will it was called in the first place. Um, an example of how to use it, I, I have a I have a very simple function here, the make path that takes a prefix and a name and it concat concatenates it with a slash in between. Um, if I make it a variable and then I call it, so the prefix is slash user and the name is discovery, which is the name of my team, um, I get the path that contains the result, but the path also has an override function I can call with some additional argument that will be used to replace the original arguments of the function. And so here I can call um, I can call the pass overriding just the name, it will keep the original prefix and I get my new result which is my new name with my original prefix. And this, this technique, we, we can use it on our definition of derivations. I can actually make, so first of all I have to change things a bit, I, I need to make the definition of my derivation a function that will take the argument I want to override, so I, I change the important, I make it a function, important param is now uh, it's now an argument of that function. It defaults to 10 and it's used in the, in the definition of the derivation. And then I can make candidates, I, I can make it overridable and get the candidates by calling make candidates. And this allows me to write this. This allows me to get my definition and write overrides, uh, sorry, and call overrides on it to, to change the value on the important parameter and get a new derivation that is exactly the same one as before except this specific parameter has been overridden. And I can do that for parameter, but I can also do that for dependencies. Uh, in here, I will make my enriched candidate overridable by setting candidate to be an argument of the function. I do the same thing, and that allows me to, to do that also. I can now override what candidate is in the definition of enriched candidates. I could make it another derivation, or I could make it another hardcoded path, uh, a string. I have pre-computed it. I absolutely want to run it on that pre-computed value. I can do it that way. This will return me a new derivation that is exactly the same as an rich candidate, except the input, the candidate's input is this one instead of, of whatever I had before. And that's already pretty nice. I am now able to take any single batch job, any single derivation I have, and, and override it and tweak it and change one or multiple parameters in here. But that's not yet what I want. I remember I wanted to tweak the entire pipeline. I wanted to take a derivation and change it and then get the final result. That, I don't have it yet. So le let's get it. This is what I want to write. I want to say, import my production definitions and uh, extend it by changing what candidates 
is in that set. Not just what candidate is for enriching it date, but rather what it, what it is in that specific in in that in that pipeline. Um, and the issue I encounter while doing that is that I defined all my jobs with a recursive set, which means that once I evaluate Nix, I get these setbacks. The recursion is 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 part of the syntax of Nix. Uh, so I get a set that contains candidates and enriched candidates, but there's nothing in that set that tells me that can the, the attribute candidates in that set was used in the definition of enriched candidates. I, it is the case. I use the attribute candidates here in the definition, but when I get that back, I've lost that piece of information, which I will need if I want to actually do that, that override. And so the way to work around that is to, is to do the, the recursion ourselves. Instead of defining, defining it as a set, at the recursive set, we define it as a function that takes a set and, re and returns a set, and that will use an input set to, well, to look into itself, because we're going to call it by passing its output at as, as its own input. It's a technique that is called, um, it's uh, the fixed point recursion. It's, it's pretty common in, in uh, um, well, in lazy functional programming, it's and yeah, it allows us to represent our set this way and get the exact same result we had before. So if I change my, my representation of my pipeline, of my set to that, I can define this make extensible, and this is also something we can find uh, in Nix packages, albeit this one is, 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 a, is a bit tweaked. Um, and it will return the fixed point of the set, so the actual set of, uh, of derivations I want, plus an extend function that will allow me to, to well, to, to modify, to tweak the recursive set before actually applying the recursion, which will which allows, allows me to do exactly the thing I want. It allows me to say, I want the set, but I want to modify something in the definition of the set, and then all the stuff that are recursively defined, depending on this, will also be changed. And the last two things I was mentioning, well, I can use them together. I can use that extend to change, some uh, to, to change the definition of the whole pipeline, A, and I can use that override to change one parameter. And this is the thing I wanted. This is actually the, the, the thing I wanted in the first place. This allows me to say, oh, I want to take the definition I have for my production, production pipeline and change the candidates uh, and change the important param parameter of the candidates to this and get the final result that depend on this. And, and this, this gives it to me. I, I, I actually have it. Um, so, so, so in conclusion, well, Nix is a pretty awesome DSL for data pipelines. Not, not only does it give me a very nice way to express the data pipeline, it also gives me that, that overriding feature I wanted and that I, to be frank, have not found in any other tool for, that, that is usually used to, to express data, data pipelines. Uh, but the other thing I want to conclude out of that is that data pipelines is a great laboratory for Nix. Having this, small set of packages, a small set of patch jobs and, and derivations allowed me to, well, to explore this abstraction and to actually understand them, uh, uh, to explore this abstraction we have in Nix packages, but in a much, um, much smaller scope. And to finish kind of on, on a <coughs> teaser note, it also allowed me to explore different techniques that are not used, that are not yet used in, in Nix packages. Um, I I took some inspiration from some, some design document around configurations, around expressing uh, derivations as, and expressing packages as, as recursi recursive sets. And I implemented another version of my old uh, pipeline definition, but based on that idea, based on having recursive sets. And it works quite well. It's, uh, it's actually nicer to, to use and to express than the original thing. And it allows me in the end to, to do my, my end derivation with that by saying, this is a different definition of extent. It's not the same one as before, but to say, I want to take my whole pipeline and I want to change candidates that important, important parameter set it to 11 and enrich candidate that number of executors uh, set to 500. And this is actually pretty nice because as, as Elko mentioned earlier, this is a way to get around the, the restrictions or, uh, around overrides, around override attribute, which I, which I have not mentioned, but is another way to override that you kind of have to get into also if you want to express every every single of array you want. And yeah, and, and it's actually pretty nice. So that, that's everything I, ha I have. Thank you very much for uh, your attention.
Pakaris, thank you so much for your great talk. Do we have questions? Oh, yes. Hands raising up already. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, just a quick question. So you, you write your own logic in Mix. Um, how do you test it? How can you prove that what you intend um, is actually happening? Thanks. Um, that, that's a very good question, one, one I have not solved yet. Uh, it, it's actually a question that, that you have in every single data, uh, data pipeline configuration tool. Uh, we, in, in the current configuration we have, we have very strict tests that test that the command, the actual command we run are the one we want to be running. This is too much testing because every time we want to make a change in the pipeline, we change the test to reflect it without really thinking about it. Uh, I don't have a good answer on how to actually test it in a way that is not just check that the output is exactly the thing that you want to run. So I know upstream HNIX doesn't have string context yet. How did you implement that? And it does have string context. It's uh, just not being added to anything. I kind of made the patch quickly oh, okay. in a corner. Okay, you just hacked it. I was wondering if you had like a good solution there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I am. I implemented in, a, in the previous uh, in the previous iteration of uh, of H uh, HNIX before all the recursive, uh, recursive things were were fixed, oh, okay. and I I, I re-implemented it. Uh, it's it's got a pull request that is closed because it doesn't go in the right direction, but it's good enough to work here. Uh, you are using this in production or? I I am not using this in production. It's yeah. mostly in the proof of concept state for now. Uh, mostly, it's not because it's not good, it's because the, well, the quality of the code I wrote to make it work is definitely not production great. Um, Sub-question, uh, did you show this to your coworkers and what did they say? Th I showed this to my coworkers and they say, why is this not yet in production? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. You may feel free to raise your hand so I actually see it. <laughs> uh, do you plan to open source it at some point? Or? Yeah, I still have to entangle the, the part that are open sourceable and the part that are really tied to the, the, stuff, the, the actual pipeline we run and that I cannot make public. But yeah, I will definitely want to open source that in the coming weeks. Good time for one last question. Yes. Thanks. Um, so this looks really great for like pure data pipelines. Um, do you have any way to uh, integrate with asynchronous triggers, like say a, another team provides some data, or a human has to sign off on something, or something like that? Um, no, it's either a limitation or at least something that is definitely not not solved by this. Um, in one of the previous version of my slide, I I had some some list of of limitations, but the the idea is. This could be the basis to build some very nice uh, building tool. Not the building tool, not all of the build tool itself, or, or rather the job scheduling tool itself, but the basis to build it. Uh, there are still other problems you need to solve on top, such as the one you, you say. For now, in my, uh, in my proof of concept, the way I, I solved it is that I have some bash script that resolve external dependencies and, and pass them as, as argument to the next code. You, you would definitely want something better for production. Okay, alrighty, that's all, time, uh, all the time we have, so thank you so much for your wonderful talk.